Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, is brought to you by the members of the John Adams. Why not become a member yourself, or even better, a patron, and enjoy all the extras and benefits? Find out more at john-adams.nl, john-adams.nl, and click on Become a Member. From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. And our next guest is a film director warning our Amsterdam audience not to be naive. But I hope you didn't drink the Kool-Aid that when Obama got elected, that racism and prejudice was going to be wiped out overnight. Didn't happen, and there's a good chance he might not even be re-elected. We're in the biggest... Depression, since the Depression, people, there are no jobs, people out of work, people lost their homes, their life savings. So it's a very critical time. Barack Obama was in the middle of his first term when the John Adams hosted Spike Lee back in December of 2010. Among a great many topics, Spike talked about how New York City's historically hot and dangerous summer of 77 got him started in filmmaking. And Mr. Lee's talk was also something of a time capsule of America at the end of the first decade of the 21st century. He also talks about how the U.S. and Europe were still digging themselves out of the worst recession since the crash of 29, the rise of the Tea Party movement, and how the likes of Sarah Palin and Fox News were changing the cultural landscape. Despite this, or maybe because of this, Spike talked about how young people can still make their voices heard and follow their dreams. There's some salty language around the 25-minute mark. So here's fellow Brooklynite and fellow John Dewey High School graduate, the great Spike Lee. Growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I had no idea people made films. I went to movie theaters, but I never thought about how they got made. My friends and I would go to the movie theater, excuse me, on Saturdays, the Saturday matinee, and we would uh, spend the whole day in the movie theater and try not to get thrown out because we were throwing stuff at the screen, food, popcorn, and at each other. I did not grow up to be a filmmaker. And it wasn't until I was in college that I decided to do something I want to do. It was expected me to go to college because uh, my parents and grandparents, they went to college. And my father and grandfather went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. That's where Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King went. Also, Samuel Jackson, a lot of other people. And so it was expected I go to Morehouse. But I went to college. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And my, my first two years in school, my freshman and sophomore years, I was a terrible student. And it's not because I was intelligent but I was just not motivated. I was not taking classes that I liked, and my grades, my grades reflected that. And at the end of my sophomore year, before it was time to go back, before school ended, and for me to go back to New York for the summer, my advisor told me, that had a, said she wanted to meet with me, and we had a meeting, and she said to think long and hard over the summer about what I wanted to do, to, to choose a major. And I said, why? She said, because I had exhausted all my electives. So I went back to New York that summer. It was the summer of 1977, a very historic summer in the history of New York City. There were completely no jobs. New York City was broke. So I could not earn any money during the summer. And the previous Christmas that summer, someone had given me a Super 8 camera and a box of film. I still can't remember who it was. I never opened it. For some reason, providence, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, I said, let me, so I'm not doing anything this summer. Let me just run around New York City and shoot stuff with a Super 8 camera. I had never really shot anything before. Had no idea what this was going to lead to. It was just a question of trying to be constructive with the two months I had home for the summer. It was one of those hottest summers on record till last summer in New York City. So consequently, when they had the blackout, the New Yorkers who were who were African-American, Puerto Rican, starred the loot. I took my camera out there and, and filmed that. It was also the, the first summer of disco, 
and the dance was the hustle and every, on the weekends, every block had a block party and the DJs were hooking up their, their turntables and their speakers to the street lamps, and so I was filming that. And then there was a, a psychopath named David Berkowitz, son of Sam, who had all of white New Yorkers terrified. Black people weren't scared that much because he wasn't just killing us. <laughs> this is before gentrification. We would spot him the minute he stepped foot in several neighborhoods. Today in Harlem or Bed-Stuy, he'd get away with it. But back then, they would have nailed his ass. So we weren't too worried about, about Summer, Summer of Sam killing black people. And so at the end of the summer, I went back to Atlanta, went back to Morehouse, and I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. And Morehouse didn't have that major. I took, the, I took my classes across the street at Clark College, mass communications and compass, not only film, but print journalism, radio, and TV. And there's one teacher there, his name was Dr. Herb Eichelberger, and he still teaches there today. For some reason, he took interest in me and encouraged me to take this raw footage, which I had no idea what I would do with it, or if I wanted to do anything with it. He's the one who encouraged me, all that footage you shot, try to give a narrative, try to tell a story with that. And so for all that semester, he worked with me. Many nights, when it was time for him to go home, he would stay an extra two or three hours just so I could use the film lab. And so with successful people, a lot of times there's people you never heard of, that there are people that, that crossed their paths along the way that made it possible for who they became. And Dr. Herb Eichelberg was one of those people for me. And when I finally finished the film and showed it to my class, they liked it. And so that was a great feeling, knowing something I had done, I had done on a whim. And under tutelage, Dr. Eichelberg to showed it to my class, they liked it, and I said, then I decided this is what I want to do. So when people ask me, when did you become a filmmaker, or would you want to become a filmmaker, I always say, filmmaking chose me. I'm going to repeat that. Filmmaking chose me. Because I say my prayers every night because I'm doing what I love. And any person on this earth that can work at a job that you love, you are blessed. Because the majority of these people go to their grave having worked the job they hated all their life. The majority of people on this earth Go to their grave having worked at a job they hated all their life. And when you're doing what you love, it's not a job. We are doing what you love is not a job. You, if you read the biographies of any great artist, where any person has done something, they say, it's not a job. Michael Jordan made millions of dollars. He said, I love basketball. I would do it for free. Well, he was kind of half kidding. <laughs> but again, when you're doing something, it doesn't seem like work. And so, that's why it's very important when I speak to young people, I do this often, lecturing across the United States, I try to, to instill into these young minds that you cannot choose a major just based on how much money you're gonna make. Every day, you could pick up the paper and somebody blew their brains out or jumped out a window, had a bunch of money in their bank account all over the world. So of course you have to have some understanding, you know, you gotta pay bills, but don't base your major solely on how much money, solely on how much money you're gonna make. I was very lucky because I had parents, my father's a, jazz, a great jazz musician, Bill Lee, my mother's a teacher, was a teacher. And so in our household, the arts was encouraged. My classmates in Morehouse weren't so fortunate. They were discouraged from choosing a major or a route in life that dealt with the arts. And it's not because these parents were Nazis, just that most parents want more for their children what they had, and they think of their infinite wisdom that they know what's best for their children. That is why I say, parents kill more dreams than anybody. And repeat, another thing I'm repeating tonight. So that's why you have to be very careful. Of course, you want to try to give guidance to your children, but you shouldn't do anything that's gonna kill their dream. Because if you kill that, then you kill the very, important part of why we all live to, to define something than what we do. So the moment I decided that film chose me, I said, I'm going to try, try to give different, different representations of, Af of the African-American experience on screen. Growing up, for me, it was really Sidney Poitier. That was it. As a young age, then you had Richard Pryor and Whoopi Goldberg, Eddie Murphy. 
But that was it. There's only, well, there, was, there was only one African American director working in Hollywood at the time. His name was Michael Shows, who directed a lot of the hit Richard Pryor films. At the time, Richard Pryor was the biggest star in Hollywood. But from the very beginning, I wanted to show different aspects of, of who we are. Because I stand before you, I'm a descendant of slaves. My ancestors were enslaved over the exact date it's sketchy, but I like to use 400 years. So America was built upon the enslavement of the people, slaves who were stolen from, from Africa, and also genocide against the Native Americans. Now, I don't care what you read in your history books and what they say, that's how the country was built, on the free labor of slaves and almost complete annihilation of a people who are now shunned to, I don't recall them, reservations. They're more like concentration camps. That's how this country was built. And so when you think about this, it becomes very interesting because the people who, start, who started America, you might, as they said, the so-called framers, they thought they were very godlike, Christian-like people. What a dilemma. I'm a God-like person, I fear God, I believe in God, so how am I gonna come to terms with me owning slaves and killing Native Americans, they called Indians? Oh, that's easy. They're not human beings. The Native Americans are savages, and the, the slaves, they're not human beings. That's why in the Constitution of the United States, slaves were referred to as three-fifths of a human being. I'm not making this up. They're referred to as three-fifths of a human being. That's not whole. That's not four fourths, not five fifths, not eighth eighths, that's less than a human being. That's how they try to get around it. But when they met their maker, I don't think that slid, in my opinion. So upon graduation from Morehouse, I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. But I did not really want to go the route of just going out to Hollywood. I've heard the stories of people working their way up from the mailroom, but nobody black. I said, I'll get there, but I gotta, go, I, go, I gotta go a different route through the back door. So I said, I'm gonna go to film school. So I applied to the top three film schools at the time, USC, Southern Cal, well, Spielberg and Semeckis, all those guys went to, Lucas too, George Lucas, American Film Institute, AFI, both of those are in L.A. and NYU. But to get into USC and AFI, you had to get an astronomical score on the GRE. That's a standardized test. So I took that test. I did not get that astronomical score, so I was not admitted. But lucky for me, there are more progressive people thinking NYU understood, understood that standardized tests should not be the only way to determine if somebody should get in film school. Now, maybe if you go into law school, med school, business school, but not for film school. So I got in, and that's where I became a filmmaker. You don't become a filmmaker by talking about it. You become a filmmaker by making films. And at NYU, if you're enrolled in a program, everybody makes a film. At, US, at USC and AFI, you write a script, and then the teachers determine which scripts get made. That's like a studio, a studio system right there. When you come out of film school, you want to have a film because the degree really doesn't mean anything. Now, when I went to school back then, the only reason why you went to film school was because you wanted access to the equipment. This before the digital technology revolution. You just wanted the equipment because you couldn't get access to the equipment. And you went to film school, you got the equipment, your classmates were your crew, and the school had agreement with the Screen Actors Guild, so you could work professional actors. And when you're in film school, you get graded on your films. The, the, the faculty sits in the theater at the school, and they look at your films and get graded. And when I went back there, they will kick out half the class at the end of the year. They don't do that anymore, but they used to. And I got kicked out because of a film I did. It was a film called The Answer. And it's about a young black screenwriter who's hired by, a studio, by the studios to write and direct a remake of D.W. Griffin's Birth of a Nation. And they did not like that film. <laughs> I was not against Birth of Nation being taught in the school, but none of the faculty put it in historical perspective. 
Of course, it's great to say David Griffith was the father of cinema. He came with a lot of innovation that's still used today. But you can't leave out this film was used as a rec recruiting tool for the Klan and consequently got black people lynched and castrated. They left that out completely. We dealt with that in the film. They didn't like it. Now, I was a, a, a teaching assistant my first year, and I worked very hard in the equipment room. So somebody made the mistake of giving me a scholarship for the next year because I worked hard before the evaluations came. So <laughs> when they said he got to go, someone said, wait a minute, we can't kick him out. We gave him a scholarship for next year already. <laughs> and that's how it happened. And throughout my artistic career, every single time I'm about to take a step that's going off the ledge, the spirit, the force, whatever, whatever you want to call it, pushes me in, the right, in the, the right direction away from peril. And at the time, because you might not have the understanding of what's happened, you think it's the worst thing that ever happened. But only later do you understand, like, God damn, that was close. <laughs> that could have been the end of me. And that was the first, one of the first things that happened. And so I'm a very spiritual person. I believe that most things that aren't, don't happen, they're a coincidence. Uh, there's a greatest spirit above us. And if you live correct, as best you can, we're all human beings, that for the most part, you'll be looked after. Because my grandma used to say, God don't like ugly. <laughs> and I've seen it in person. Another person I'd like to comment about, besides Dr. Herb Eichelberg, a people who were very responsible for me being here, is my grandmother. My grandmother's no longer here. Her, her name is Zimmy Rita Shelton. She lived to be 100 years old. Her mother was a slave. My grandmother's mother was a slave, yet she got a college education. She went to Spelman, and my mother went to Spelman. These are like sister schools that across the street from each other in Atlanta, Georgia. And so don't let anybody ever tell you that education was not a part a strong part of African American experience. Now it's gone, it's gone kind of crazy now, but that's a recent occurrence. I tried to vise stuff into BC, before crack, AC, after crack. Because <laughs> we're still dealing with the, the devastations and the reverberation of crack. But my grandmother, she was a great art teacher. Her, famous, her, her favorite painter was Picasso. And for 50 years, she taught art. She taught art in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Macon, Georgia. This is the Deep South. And for 50 years, she never had one white student because of the segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws in the South. And a whole lot of white kids messed up in a great teacher because of laws at the time. And my grandmother saved her Social Security checks for 50 years for grandchildren's education. And since I was the first grandchild, I had first dibs. So my grandmother put me through Morehouse and put me through NYU Film School and gave me the seed money for she's gonna have it too. What was crucial, she did not try to crush my dream. My grandmother wouldn't know filmmaking from a hole in the wall. But she saw this is what her grandson wanted to do, and she supported me. You can't estimate the, underestimate the support that you can get from your family. The checks weren't a lot, but after 50 years, you get interest. So it was, it was a sizable amount of money. And when I told my grandma I wanted to be a filmmaker, she said, Spikey, I don't know anything about filmmaking, but if this is what you want to do, I'm going to support you. So every time I speak, I try to mention my grandmother. Even though I'm a filmmaker, I still consider myself an educator, too. My grandmother was a teacher. My mother taught black literature. My father teaches bass. My great-grandfather was a disciple of Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee Institute. And so I come a long line of educated African Americans. And this is not like some freak accident. Education, until recent, 
has always been a pillar of our existence. In fact, I would like to tell this story. During slavery, it was against the law for slaves to read and write. It was against the law. Yet the slaves that had the education, they knew it was their duty to try to teach other people. Because our ancestors had the foresight and understand that education would be one of the ways to lead us out of the wilderness of education. Not the wilderness of, of, of slavery, of bondage. And three things can happen to you if Mazza caught you reading and writing. We could go in order from bad to worse. Whipped, castrated, or hung. But even with that hanging over their heads, the ones who knew would try to pass it on. So my generation, pre-crack, on my block in Brooklyn, which was unlike any other urban or rural area where there were black people in America, we never, ever made fun of if you were smart. If you were smart, you got the same love that you got if you could play ball. If you were smart, you got the same love if you know how to rap and talk to the girls. That is not the case today. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the effects of this whole rap stuff, the negative aspects of it. You have black people, young black kids today, who fail class on purpose because if you get A's, if you speak correct English, you're ostracized as being white, an Oreo, a sellout. Well, if you're on the corner drinking a 40, smoking a blunt, holding your nuts, with your pants dropped below your ass, then you're cool, you're hip, you're gangster, you're ghetto, not knowing you're just fucking ignorant. <laughs> and so what has happened, and this is genocide, with these young ladies, now I'm not making a blanket statement, but it's, it's a lot to not be dismissed. What has happened is that in these lot of young black minds, they somehow equate white with acting educated and black with acting ignorant. Half of black students today below 12th grade don't graduate high school in America. And but there's a direct correlation between that number and the prison population. And you haven't read, but a lot of prisons in America have become privatized. Business is booming. Locking black folks up, left and right. There are more black men incarcerated in jails and prisons than enroll in college and universities in America. So this is not something I make up. You go, up, go home, look, Google it. It'll still be the same, I'm telling the truth. In America today, of African-American households, Three out of four African-American households, the father's not there. That's 75% of all African-American households, the father's not there. These young black boys are going crazy. I think it has to do a lot with there's, there's not a man in the house. The mothers, they're doing the best they can. I'm not up here trying to slam them. But mommy can't be daddy too. If the family's falling apart, it doesn't take... Einstein to figure out the reverberation of that house can affect everything else. Media has a lot to do with this. If you look at some of the videos, not all rap, I would say a major part of gangster rap, where all these things are glamorized, all these negative things, people end up being hurt in the long run. These are things we're dealing with in the country, and I know some of you have never been to the United States. That's all right. But I hope you, don't, you didn't drink the Kool-Aid that when Obama got elected, that racism and prejudice was going to be wiped out overnight. Didn't happen, and there's a good chance he might not even be re-elected. Re Sarah Palin and these, these teabagger motherfuckers, they're not playing. <laughs> Fox News, I mean, they've been on Obama's ass from day one. So it's not the... It might not be the, the rosy picture that you might be getting from afar. You know, we're in the biggest depression since the Depression. 
People, there are no jobs, people out of work, people lost their homes, their life savings. So it's a very critical time. And uh, we'll see what happens. But as I was telling some young students today, sometimes the best art comes out when things are the most fucked up. And hopefully that will be the case. Well, I'm trying to do a film. For me, the most important thing is the story. That, that it's not subject matter, it's not this or that. It's trying to tell a story. And the great filmmakers who I love also are great storytellers. So I want to thank you tonight. Thank you for coming out. Spike Lee speaking at the Amsterdam Stadtschouwberg back in December of 2010. It really takes you back, doesn't it? Did you know that you can go to our website, john-adams.nl slash videos, where there's a full video, including an extended question and answer session of this live event. It's really worth watching. We also have a newsletter you can sign up for and a veritable treasure trove of great American thinkers and speakers at john-adams.nl. And while you're there, why not become a member? of the John Adams. Not only will you support what we do, you get a discount to future live events. In the meantime, you should go to wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review of this show. This will help get the word out and we can keep on sharing the very best of American thinkers with you, free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz. From Amsterdam, this was Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Gruber. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.